the gift. We thank our Father for his gifts, but I, I want you to know what the word gift, as it was utilized in the manuscripts, whereby we're going to be using it today. And it's an English, it's a Greek word that has been worked into the English language. It's called charisma. And we use the word charisma a great deal in the English language, but that's what the word gift means from God. It's charisma. That's why a Christian, when they walk into a room, make a difference. Because with having the gift, they have a charisma about them. And it does lighten up a room. It makes a difference. It makes a change. Now, uh, at the same time, I think I want you to learn another Greek word. It's called charis, which comes from charisma. Or they come from a word that they both come from a sister word, a prime. But charis in English is grace. It's God's grace. Um, the word means free, but it also means uh, gratuity. Now, gratuity is an English word which means not as gratis. We all use the word free gratis. You know, that means it costs nothing. It's for no reason. There's just no charge. Well, Gratuity is not gratis, all right? Gratuity, though many people like to take it as such, sometimes they call a tip gratuity. Gratuity has been added to your bill. Well, that kind of spoils the name of gratuity. However, gratuity is a gift for services having been delivered or services received. So what you need to think about is that word charisma meaning a gift for services received, I don't know, what have you done for the Lord lately? See, that's a question you want to ask yourself because the gift does not come. And I'm not talking about intuitive salvation that you have. He paid the price that yours for the taking. I'm talking about in your everyday life. Many people wonder, well, why doesn't God answer my prayers? Well, what have you done for the Lord? He, he keeps everybody caught up. He's not partial. He doesn't play favorites. He has no favorites. He, he's not a respecter of persons. It's what you do, whether you obey him or not, that he then gives the gift. And the gift is very difficult without his word to explain, so that's why we're going to go into it a little bit today so that we can grasp, how do I get something for free that I'm not really supposed to hang on to, I'm supposed to give it away? You know, that's, that is true. I get something from God, it's a gift, it's charisma, but so that he may have charis, which is to say his grace abound, I've got to share it. Well, now, a real Christian doesn't worry about sharing, all right? They're not bashful, necessarily. And I'm, not t I'm talking about spiritually now. Sometimes in the flesh, some of us are bashful. I was so bashful till I was 18. I couldn't even ask a girl for a date, you know. I was really bashful. But charisma will give you the spirit and the unction and a gift. And hopefully, like many people think, I have the gift of teaching. And hopefully I do because I love to teach. Now, the word... Charisma, which is your gift. Actually, it's religious gratuity. All right, that's what brings it. Now, the word charis or grace, charis is for undeserved favor, basically. You can say that it is, that's to say God's grace. It's divine influence on your heart. That's God's grace. Also, this same word, charis, is translated 156 times as grace, and it's translated 130 times as favor, that God does you a favor. But it is gratuity, meaning he does you a favor because you've given him a service. And what kind of service are we talking about? Well, some of you, is just a smile to somebody that really needed a smile, a good Christian smile taken in the right way and given in brotherhood, brothers, uh, uh, brothership, 
you know, as, as given in a Christian way that it picks someone up that's down just a little bit, having a bad day. That, that really, God, that just really pleases him. And someone to tell him, uh, in as much as you are made in his image, he, he, we're made in his image, and he looks like we do, and we look like him, the human form, only naturally he is a spirit. But at the same time, he has emotions because we're made in his likeness, meaning he has like feelings that we do. You can hurt his feelings. Or you can bless him by letting him know you love him. I mean, he appreciates love. And he doesn't want you to go through me or someone else to tell him you love him. How, does, how would you feel if your husband came up and said, would you go over there and tell my wife I love her? I'm afraid Mama, would, she may be a little unhappy about that if you didn't tell her, darling, you know I love you from the bottom of my heart, okay? And she appreciates it, and vice versa. Yeah. So, so does your father. That's why he gives these gifts. He gives you charisma because you love him, and you talk to him anytime you want to talk to him and you don't have to say it out loud he knows what you're thinking and um, that's why in the Greek he's called the heart knower because he knows what's in your heart and in the manuscripts that is to say and he loves you a great deal I want you to know that he may not love what you're doing but he does love you and he, he wants you to let him know that so in as much as God doesn't f play favorites the little children could not have picked a better song, and that's a hard Bible lesson to follow, you know what, the song about this world, because it is a world without end. But the fact that there were people that died before Christ was crucified, they didn't have the privilege of repentance as you do by his blood on the cross. So does that make God unfair then that everybody back to the time of Adam and Noah that died in sin didn't have Christ to have paid that price whereby they could have forgiveness? Wouldn't that make God just a little bit unfair? If you think so, then you do not understand God's plan. You don't have the faith in him enough to trust him that he treats everyone equally. So I want to pick that thought up in the first book of Peter, in the uh, third chapter, of how God even that up whereby people all the way back to Noah had the privilege of salvation from Christ himself. That, and why am I doing that? So that you know how fair our Father is to all of his children. Again, he does not play favorites. Okay, so I want to pick it up then, if I may, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. And um, I would bring you up to speed there, but let it be so that I, I, what I have said set the stage for the point I wish to make. Uh, chapter 3, 1 Peter, verse 17, and it reads, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Why? Well, if somebody criticizes you for being a Christian and you suffer for it, you're going to get so many blessings, so many gifts, that it's certainly going to outweigh what little tarnish you might have got some from perverted, some perverted mind that would be said against Christianity. You don't have to worry about it, in other words. It's better. If you're going to suffer, don't let it be for some sin you've committed, but for being a Christian. 18. For Christ also, the subject turns to Christ, nail that in your mind. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. In other words, he was totally just. He was without sin. We are unjust. That's why you can say that grace is, uh, is given in favor that we don't really deserve because we're not perfect. He was. He traded himself, the perfect one, for we who are imperfect when we say, Father, forgive me. That he might bring us to God. What was the purpose? 
God wants you brought to him. Why? He loves you. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, this word in the Greek means made alive by the Spirit. God makes you alive. Why? Because he gives you eternal life. Not just some, well, I guess I'll live about 70 years, kick the bucket, and that's it. No, that's not the way God operates. It's forever. Verse 19. By which also he went. He did what? He went. He traveled and preached unto the spirits in prison. What's that prison? Well, it's the opposite side of the gulf that Christ spoke in the parable concerning Lazarus and the rich man. Those that were dead in the flesh. He went there and he preached to those. Why? They didn't make it. That's why the word prison is used. 20, which sometimes were disobedient. In other words, they sinned. You know something? Just like you do sometimes. When once the long-suffering of God, that means God's patience. God is so patient with us. It's a wonder, like Dennis is teaching now about the children in the wilderness. I, I've you know, I can understand, I can't, sometimes I have difficulty understanding why God just didn't wipe them out. You know, show them miracle after miracle after miracle, and then they murmur and gripe and complain. They're in the wilderness after actually seeing the pillar of fire and the cloud by day to guide them and protect them. Just, I mean, a bunch of sour heads. But God loves his children just like we love ours. And he wants to give them that privilege, that opportunity. But God waited in the day. The, I'll begin again. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Now go all the way back in your mind. While the ark was appearing, we're in few. There, that is, eight souls were saved by water. In other words, he went back all that time. Meaning, it's a... It's a Hebraism that means to the beginning and gave Christ preached to them while they were in their spiritual bodies after the flesh was dead. Preached to them and gave them the opportunity to love him and to be free. And don't you ever try to tag, well, that was a second chance. No, it wasn't. Christ hadn't paid the price on the cross yet, so they hadn't had a chance in the sense that you do, and God's not going to do you some favor that he won't do for them all the way back to then. The point I wish to make is God is kind and he is fair. The like figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurre resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so it is. 22, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. In other words, he's in charge. He's sitting at the right hand of God, and you know what? He's your advocate. That's a, a term of legality that means he's even your spiritual lawyer if you would have it. He represents you. When you do good, when you please him, when you let him know you love him, he's there. So God holds up his children when they ask, when they deserve. Gratuity is a gift for service rendered, service you have rendered in saying, if it's nothing but Father, I love you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to know your word. I want to understand your emotions because you are my father and he is the father of all. He created all souls and he loves them all. Now, well, isn't a uh, teacher, you're making quite a step there to say Christ went back and taught them. No, I'm really not because that's only one place where it is declared. And um, now we're going to get right on. Let's document it in another place here in the fourth chapter. Let's pick it up with the fifth verse of the fourth chapter of the same book, 1 Peter. Listen carefully. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? 
in other words, do you want to give God an account? He's the one that's going to judge both the quick, that's a Greek word that means the living and the dead. In other words, he doesn't see any difference, see, because they're his children, and he's more concerned about your spirit than he is your flesh body, quite frankly. These flesh bodies are perishable, they get old, they wither, but you have a spirit body that never gets old as long as you please him and as long as you're in good standing. There's not one person that appeared in angelic form, that is to say after having walked on earth and that wasn't a young person, right? young adult. Why? That's the way you are in spirit, all right? So uh, not to digress. Who wants to tell God what should happen to them? It won't do you any good because that's one reason this church doesn't keep church letters. Your letter is in heaven. And it's very accurate, a lot more accurate than we could keep a letter on you here. You know, if I pointed someone, that, well, let's keep a letter on everyone in church, some of their actions and what they do and their membership, I might appoint a person that was partial to certain people. I'm not about to do this, so don't anybody get nervous, okay? I haven't for 50 years, and I'm a little old to start changing my ways. God keeps the record. It's all written in heaven. He's got an accurate account of you. And hey, you know, if, like it's the same as joining this church. People say, well, how do I join? I say, hey, you've got to take it up with him. You know, if, if he loves you and you love him and, and he passes on you, if, if you're good enough for him, you're sure good enough for me. And as I often say, there's some of you I might not have picked, you know, but God picked you and that's good enough for me. I'm kidding. I'm jesting, all right? But God does the choosing. He touches the hearts of the people. And he calls his children forth when it's that time. Why? He loves you. He cares. I hope you care about him. He that came himself, Emmanuel, God with us, and paid that price on the cross so we can say, I repent. And I have a fresh start wonderful it's beautiful all right he's the judge that's the point verse six let's continue for for this cause this was the reason was the gospel preached also to them that are dead well lo and behold there it is again christ went and preached the gospel to the dead well why wouldn't he they're god's children you're no better than they are that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, that they would have the same equal judgment that you do, but live according to God in the Spirit. In other words, even back to the time of the flood, and those who were killed there had the opportunity when he preached that gospel, the God's spell, that's what gospel means, the good news. Verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand hand be ye therefore sober that means be very serious be sincere and watch unto prayer in other words uh, when you pray you that's what is prayer it's talking to your father talking to him letting him know your feelings your emotions and that way he can reach down if he desires and give you that gift that charisma that can touch you, that can change your very being, okay? Eight, and above all things, this is foremost, have fervent charity. You know what that word charity is? It's love. It's a guppy, a guppy in the Greek. And it comes from a word that means uh, kind of like brotherly love, all right? It's, it's a spiritual and moral love, all right? That's what the word means, spiritual and moral love. Have that spiritual, fervent spiritual and moral love among yourselves for charity, for that spiritual moral love shall cover the multitude of sins. Do you think that when God really loves someone and they love him and let him know that it doesn't make a little bit of a difference in your daily life, 
I think the good old King James, and do you know something? The Greek manuscripts say the same thing. Shall cover, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Because none of you are perfect. You all fall short at times. Some of you put yourself on some little guilt trip then and say, I can't let anybody know but I'm sin. Well, God knows. Don't try to hide it from him. Say, Lord, I did, it, I did it again, didn't I, Father? I'm sorry. But if you've been doing right, if you have practiced the gift, if your charisma, if you have utilized it, then you have done enough good things by helping people to hold them up, to lift them, to encourage them. And just your presence, that's what charisma is. You don't have to be a preacher. Just being a good person can cover a multitude of sins. Now, if you think I'm saying this replaces forgiveness of sins through Christ, you're mistaken. I'm just saying that God, the judge, does look favorably upon those that have love for him and mankind. Because if you have got love for God and mankind, you can't really help doing right most of the time. And that does indeed cover a multitude of sin. Nine, use hospitality. That's hospitality, all right? One to another without grudging. Yeah, you will believe it. I went over there and I, I, I had to help that old boy plow his garden. <laughs> Just, oh, it was hot. It's terrible plowing his garden. Well, you, as far as any gratuity for it, you might as well forget it. God's already written it off. He did a good thing and now he's griping about it. <laughs> Tear that one away and throw it in the trash. You know. well, what does that say about a person? It means they're not genuine in their heart. If you really want to help someone, you can't, after having helped them, rejoicing with them that it was done, that we had the victory. You show me a griper over something uh, of someone that has helped someone. Now, this doesn't mean you're supposed to let someone take advantage of you, all right? Now, you know. God keeps an equal rope, all right? Because you have people that are not Christian, they claim to be, but they don't act like it, that will flat use you. Don't you ever forget it, all right? But all in all, Christian love can't be faked, not for long. All right? You know that you know that you know. So do it with hospitality. That Check it out in the Greek. You'll be glad you did. That means that almost means with brotherly love. Philo, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It means to operate under Philo. Okay, uh, without grudging. Ten, as every man hath received the gift. Now this word gift is charisma. So let's read it that way. It's an English word also. And it's fair because that's what the, the word is utilized in the manuscripts. As every man hath received the charisma, even so minister the same. Minister means practice, pass it on. Minister the same one to another as good stewards. Do you know what a steward is? That's somebody that takes care of something precious, let's say, and doles it out or passes it out fairly, a good steward, um, passes it out fairly of the manifold grace of God. Do you know what that word grace is? Charis. Again, gratuity given for spiritual and moral deeds having been done toward God. Do you want me to read it like that and see what a difference it makes? as every man hath received the gift. In other words, every person that receives the gift of loving God through the Son. Charisma. Even so, pass that charisma the same one to another. Share it. As good stewards of that love, of that charisma, of that gift, of the manifold, manifold means bunches and bunches and bunches, of charis of God, the love of God. 
God's giving you in return. You got it? God paying you in return. Now, don't do it for that purpose. But that's your blessing. And it's real. I don't know. What have you done for God lately? If your prayers are not being answered, if God isn't blessing you, take inventory. Read that verse a few times. See what happens. Verse 11. If any man speak... Speak means to preach or pass on, you know, about the charisma. Let him, this, or this includes women as well, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, don't utter anything that God hasn't uttered in his name. If you want to upset God, just start teaching some falsehoods and see what happens to you. If you want a blessing, then preach the word of God the utterances of God, not what some yo-yo might say, I had a dream last night. If he had a dream last night and it isn't in this word, he's lying to you, all right? And you're easily misled if you listen to man, this man or any other man, over the utterances of God. God spoke it, there is nothing. Understand this, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, there is nothing new under the sun. God has uttered it. The question is, have you read it? Have you covered it with understanding? Whereby you can't be deceived, whereby you can't be fooled. This is not to say that people can't utter the word of God or the words that God has uttered. He didn't say that's a no-no. He said that's what you're supposed to do. But if you want to be punished in life, pass something on that didn't come from God and I guarantee you you will not be long in paying let's start that verse over if any man speak let him speak as the oracles or utterances of God if any man minister let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that and do you know what that word that means that shows you the purpose of the whole thing Now we can learn something. We've learned about the gift. We've learned about God's grace. That's to say his gratuity to you for having loved him and doing his work. He does all that, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God wants that praise from his children why he's good to them he deserves it when when he was so patient with them crossing the wasteland oh man you know sometimes you can read that and you could just backhand them I said that Dennis was teaching Deuteronomy his numbers I guess I did the Deuteronomy too. you know I just work here and <laughs> but I got corrected though Anyway, I could just, you know, I'm glad I wasn't the one standing there when God said, Moses, I'm going to kill every last one of them and start over with you. Oh, boy, God, you got a good idea there. You know, a lot of people would have said that, but think about Moses. But that, why am I saying that? To show you how much God loves his children. Moses fell down. He said, Lord, don't. You've given your word, your promises, and his promises are real, and he keeps them. So that's the purpose of the whole thing, that God may be glorified. Do you know what he wants to be glorified about? He's got a family. A lot of his kids are going to die if if, if, uh, the ministry isn't shared. A lot of his family is going to just be wasted. And he cares. We could turn over to, I'll I'll just, you don't have to, I'm going to do it for you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. That means he's got all kinds of patience to us, for us. Willing, not willing, rather, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants all of his children saved, but they won't be. Because 
he can't force you to love him. And I know you've all heard me say this before. Be patient with me. He can't force you to love him because love must generate to be real from within your own being. And it must move outward. Otherwise, you'd be a zombie. Love you, God. Love you, God. I won't go into the rubber woman business, all right? <laughs> Save you that. But, I, I mean, you know, God made you to a free thinking person and love can generate from you. You can't buy love. You can't order it. That's not love. It's got to come from within. And that's what he wants from his children. He's patient in bringing them to that and sharing this gratuity, grace that he lays upon the world. That he loved them enough that he came as Emmanuel, God with us, died on the cross. That all they have to do is say, forgive me and mean it. And he'll touch your heart. Why? He's your father, the nearest relative you have. And he doesn't want his children to perish, as we just read in 2 Peter. He wants them to make it. So naturally, when you reach out and touch one of them and help them, he's going to be happy with you. I mean, is there anything so unusual about that or unnatural? I think not. If one of your children or one of your maids or your friend was in danger and some person came up and grasped them and jerked them from harm's way, you saved their life, do you think that person wouldn't be thankful to you? Well, that's how God is when you share the gratuity that he gives you, the good word, the good news. When you let that embellish in one's mind to change their lives, Oh, I tell you this, God has certainly blessed this little church here in northwest Arkansas that we go into 250 television stations from all of the Americas and around the world, and we receive so many letters from people saying, the word changed my life. Not Arnold Murray or Dennis Murray or this congregation changed my life. The word of God changed my life. That's sharing the gratuity. So don't forget to do that in your own life, all right? And in doing that, that brings more blessing for an abundance of sharing that love covers a multitude of sins in the Father's judgment. Okay, and hey, I could get into this real easy. You know, I've got some ground to cover, but I could stick on that one a while. I like it. Verse 12. Behold, think it not strange. Don't, don't you think it a real strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you? Who's going to try you? Now stop and think of me. Oh, man, there's that hell fire and brimstone again. No. God is a consuming fire, right? Hebrews chapter 12, last verse. God is a consuming fire. What does the word Shekinah in the Hebrew tongue mean? It means God's presence. So naturally, if God is going to judge, it simply means the presence of the Shekinah glory. For those that he loves, it's a warming touch of the Holy Spirit. And for one that is a misfit, he is a consuming fire because they are consumed in the pit. It's kind of sad, but you don't have to think it's strange. He loves those that love him enough that there must come a time before long for a house cleaning. They've had their opportunity, and that's why you want to work diligently to see that everyone has that opportunity. Don't worry, God will see to it, but he has servants, and you happen to be one of those servants. Don't ever forget it. But don't re read love into that rather than something torturous because God is fair. Uh, verse 13, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Somebody might complain to you. Say, you're one of them Christians. Huh? I'm, <laughs> I'm proud of it. That's the way you, Christians are not second-class citizens. 
And uh, you don't have to take anything off of anybody. That is to say, if you're preaching or teaching somebody that happens to be of another faith and they reach out and tap you, then turn the other cheek. That's what Christ said to do. But if some bully comes up across you on the street and tries to run over you, knock him down. And then say, I'll pray for you, brother. You know, God doesn't expect us to let people run over us. You lose respect for people in that sense. All right? That's just common sense. Um, verse 14. If you be reproached, that means if somebody curses you, really upbraids you, unbraids you, for the name of Christ, happy are you. Hey, rejoice in it. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. He's right over your head watching out for you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. That's what the whole thing of grace is. Well, the purpose was to bring glory to him. Why? He's proud of you for having stood. He's proud of you. You don't want him to be disappointed in you, do you? Oh, did you see that one, Will? <laughs> did you see him buckle? under a little pressure. Oh, I can't trust that boy again for a while. No, don't, don't ever let that happen. You see, the story, which is history, his story is history. We win. Okay. There, there's no question. That's not up for grabs. We win. So you can take enough pride in that that you can stand up against anything when it comes to tr someone questioning truth, which is to say God's utterances, his word. 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Stay away from that stuff. You know what I tell you in this church, don't you ever dare bring in gossip to me. I will pin you down, I will say, where did you hear that? And we're going to go right down the list, and we're going to burn everybody right back and find out if it's true. And I can guarantee you it'll probably be, it's a funny thing, but when gossip passes from one to another, it explodes. Like some person stopped one of my sons the other day, and I forget I'm on national television right now. I can't tell you this right now. I can't tell you what somebody said to one of my sons the other day. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead. You know, they'll be disappointed if I don't share it with them now. He said, I heard your dad was married now because I read it in a paper. Well, he didn't read that in a paper. Didn't even indicate it, you know, but that's what it turned out to be. So you see, you can't tell about stuff like that. You, gotta, you don't listen to gossip, all right? Don't, don't enter into that kind of stuff. 16. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let, and this is, I want, I want to say right away that there's no gender in this. This means mankind, men and women, all right? So, God loves women just as much as he does men. And in my life, I've always been partial to women over men. Otherwise, there'd be something funny, wouldn't there? You know? But, I forget again, I'm on national television, but... Hello, Dolly. But anyway, uh, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Okay? In other words, um, you're going to be paid for it. If you suffer as a Christian, that means gratuity coming. Don't do it for that purpose. But that's why you can rejoice. God is going to bless you. Verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Boy, don't you ever forget that. Do you know, of, of in this room right now, as I'm standing here, do you know that God judges me rougher than he does you? Okay? Got that? Now, he's not, being, he's not playing favorites. It's that he has given me a responsibility and a charge, and if I mess up, Judgment starts right here. First, that doesn't mean you're getting off the hook. Huh? But, <laughs> but he does start here. 
and if you're going to speak, you want to always remember that, okay? But it starts just so you don't miss the point with the whole house. You're a part of the house, and that's where judgment starts. Not on some sinner out here that's just a heathen. God's not going to start judging there, here. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be for of them that obey not the gospel of God, that know better and don't obey? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If, if it's with difficulty for us, it's going to be kind of salty, and that's why you have to take names and kick dragons sometimes, all right? You can't just be a wimp and expect to serve God. God doesn't necessarily choose wimps. All right, and I'm not saying a bully, but somebody that's not afraid to show their charisma. 19, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In other words, he created your soul. Do you have the nerve to turn around and commit your soul back to him for safekeeping in as much as it just read a few verses before in his oracles, his utterances, I have my hand right over your head? That's pretty easy, isn't it, to say, God, take me, use me, when he's promised to look out for you. He says it's a gift. It's charisma. And my charis will be blessed by your charisma, your gift, that people can know. I can bless you to the point that people will say, look how God blesses that woman. Let's look in. You can't help saying, well, her credibility. Look at, look at what she does. She serves God. I've never heard her say a bad thing about a person. Not unless it was done in a constructive way by such as constructive criticism. And I don't know, have you ever heard a woman give corrective criticism? Well, easy boy, down, <laughs> down. <laughs> okay, it's getting late in this hour, and the Irish in my soul is beginning to act up, all right? But I'm going to control it as best I can. Turn with me to Romans, and we're going to close this out here before too long. I want to go to Romans. I, I want you to bear in mind that we're talking about charisma, all right, a gift from God. And I want to just, so that if you ever need to have a few scriptures to strengthen yourself, you all remember the 11th chapter of Romans. That's where it spoke, speaks of the 7,000 that will never bow a knee to Baal concerning Elijah way back in the books of Kings in the Old Testament, and how that God intends to graft in the Gentile as well as um, the uh, children of Israel. But that isn't the point I wish to make here. It has to do with charisma. Verse 29, if you will. I just want to show you that this word is utilized, you with strong concordances, I would highly recommend that you cover that, and I want you to also make a note, you with companion Bibles, of Appendix 184. I'm going to say that again. Don't turn there now, but at home, follow up on this lecture with Appendix 184 in your companion Bible. Now, verse 29 of Romans chapter 11. For the gifts, that's the charisma, and calling of God are without repentance. He's not going to take it back. If God touches you and places his hand on you, he's not going to change his mind. This is why many times when people think, well, yes, that brother fell. No, he didn't. That sister fell. They may have messed up, but their gift that was given is without repentance. God's not going to take it back. He chose it. What was it, something that happened before? Most likely. God knows. So gifts, the charisma is given without repentance. So you can thank your father for that. If he's given you that gift, he's not going to take it away from you. He may turn the damper down on it, 
you may turn away from him, but he's not going to turn away from you. I want to say that again. You may turn away from God, but God is not going to turn away from you. Right? In other words, it'll be your choice. Uh, 30. For as ye, that's you, in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. That's to say, certain people that God had to make examples of where you could see the light. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. God does not play favorites. Well, I thought he had a chosen people. He blinded them for a little while in part, those that, that he chose whereby all whomsoever will believe upon the Son. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Grasp for it, beloved. It's impossible for us to have the wisdom of God, but wrestle with it. Study the utterances. Don't listen to man. Stick with his word. It is written. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You can never tell how God works. God works in mysterious ways. He certainly does. 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? I can answer it for you. No one. Or who hath been his counselor? I wouldn't dare give him any advice, would you? Remember the little parable he used? How would you like to be a little old clay pot in my hand and you start trying to tell me how I made you wrong? You know what I do with clay pots I don't like. <laughs> and he kind of shatters them. Don't, that's a no-no. And don't ever forget, God also says in the ninth chapter of this same book, Romans, hey, now I'm going to teach it in the Greek, okay? It says, just to save time, it says, I can take a piece of clay and if I decide to make a chamber pot or a flower vase out of it, that's my business, right? Why? Because I know what Jacob I loved, Esau I hated while they were still in their mother's womb. Why? Because of what they had done in spirit, all right? Okay, no great mystery. 35, for who hath first given to him that it shall be recompensed again unto him again? Question. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Hey, he's the one. If you want your life to pick up, you stay wired in to him. And he, through gratuity, through charisma, will bless your life. In closing. I want to go, let's stay in this same book. Let's go back to chapter 5. <clears throat> we're just going to take three verses and we're out of here. Chapter 5, verse 13. Same subject, charisma, the gift. I, I, I don't know, have you gotten yours yet? Hmm? Been getting any gifts from God? Okay, 13. For unto the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. In ignorance, it just isn't. Hard to understand, not really. Think about it. 14. Nevertheless, death reigned over Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam's blood brought... Um, sin into the world, unfortunately. Christ's blood brought freedom. Okay? 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. There we have it again. Charisma. Free here it's even called. Okay? For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Have you let him into your life as you should? Think about it. If you want charisma in your family, think about it. 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, 
Adam brought that sin or allowed it, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. It brings forth forgiveness. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm not one. I'm a realist. I don't play games. I fall short, and I have to have forgiveness from God, or I'd be in bad trouble. You don't follow this man or any other man because none of us are perfect. And I, I've known some women that were almost perfect, but, I, well, what I'm saying is we need him. We all need him. We all need that forgiveness, and we all need that gift, that charisma. And it makes you wonder how many people in the charismatic movement really knew what the word meant. I don't know. The real truth, I really don't know, and it doesn't matter, because I would be gossiping about certain movements if I were to make light of it or something. But wisdom, knowledge, depth into the utterances of not man, but God will light you up an express way of life that you won't fall off in the ditch if you will allow him to guide you in your life. Why? He's your father. He's not some big puff of smoke out here in space somewhere drifting around. He looks like you do, and he has feelings like you do. Let him know today that you love him. Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. Father, be with us. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Pat from Ohio, where does the spirit go after death? Read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Instantly it goes back to the Father who gave it. Um, let's say add to what your question, what is the spirit? It is the intellect of your soul, which is to say it is the intellect of yourself. Jeff from Massachusetts, does God have a, <clears throat> I cannot read that, does God have, oh, does God have a name? And if he does, what is it? Of course he has a name. Um, this is taught in the great, when, when uh, he spoke to, um, to Moses on the mount, he gave that name. Moses said, who am I going to say sent me, sent you? Well, who am I going to say told me to tell him this? And he said, I am that I am, which is the etymology, Iya Asha Iya, in the Hebrew tongue, of the, uh, the four letters, the tetragamation that makes up YH, VH, which is very difficult for the human tongue to pronounce, but going from the etymology, it would be pronounced Yahweh, not Yahweh. The scriptures lock in VEH. It is hidden five times in the book of uh, Esther, whereby, and in the book of Psalms, so it is, by in the um, Masara. So never let someone tell you otherwise. The sacred name is Yahweh. Right, that is the correct pronunciation. Okay, Daniel in California. What happens to a person who is under one of the curses of Deuteronomy? 
What kind of punishment should a person expect? Well, you name your own. That's the way God operates. Out of your own mouth, you condemn yourself. So it's whatever, but hey, Daniel, why would you, why would you want to stay under a curse when all you've got to do is repent and it's gone? And you can have blessings and wealth if you go for it. I'm going to tell you something. The harder you work, the wealthier you are. And let me say this. The harder you work this and have faith in God, you are blessed. So don't, don't, don't worry about being under a punishment when it's so easy to have faith to rid yourself of it and focus and discipline yourself in the Word of God. The trouble with most people, they have absolutely no discipline. The word disciple, which is what Christ called the students, comes from the word discipline. So you discipline yourself to follow God's word and not man's word, not this man or any other man. Always know this, you're going to be judged all right, by the judge. And there's not going to be any man between you and God. So you've got to focus on the word itself because you are going to answer to it. And out of your own mouth, you convict yourself by, in other words, if you do a sin that falls under one of those curses, it would be trying to rip somebody off. It means you're about to get ripped, okay? Or whatever the case, that's what I mean. Doris from Michigan. <clears throat> My question is, will the Holy Spirit ever leave the world. No, Doris, come on. Hebrews, the 13th chapter says what? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And wherever he is, the Holy Spirit is present. Okay, that's his promise. He'll never leave us. I know there are a few <clears throat> people claim the Holy Spirit's going in the rapture. Bye-bye, play butter. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad. Being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction.